guys, welcome back for a very special Collider video interview. I'm Perry Nemiroff, but you don't care about that. You only care about this great guy right here. We have an interview happening right now with Guillermo del Toro. Michael Moore's done double. <laughs> I cannot thank you enough for coming in today. We're, I'm Pleasure. the whole studio. We're all so hyped about this. We're all so hyped about so many things you're working on. So thanks for coming in so we can a celebrate pleasure. some of your stuff. Pleasure. First off, we have to talk Troll Hunters because mm -hmm. I, do, I binged it. I mean, you go through it, it is just so much fun. It's a delightful show that I imagine kids and parents, everyone's yeah. gonna love. And also, you know, it's, it's an Emmy winning show. Yeah. It, that's absolutely crazy. So uh, at, at what point did you realize, cause I'm sure you believed in it from day one, but when did you realize yeah. that this was really something special? Well, you always believe and you don't believe. I mean, it's always people that say they're always sure it's not true. You go from being a moron to being a genius to being a moron to, it is, it, you go up and down all the time is a nature of storytelling, but uh, we wrote the novel, I don't know, almost uh, seven years ago, six years ago, and uh, I had this idea since I was a kid, you know, and uh, you know, you think, I, I, we obviously started four years before Stranger Things. I actually kind of mentored the Duffer brothers when we were, I was post-producing Pacific Rim and they were trying to finish a horror movie at Warner's, and I always thought, wouldn't it be cool to do an Amblin show? You know, sort of a, a going back to a time where you were riding bicycles, blah, 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 but, and about friendship, you know, because I think TV is about spending time with people you like. That's the reality. It's like the definition of troll hunters. It is. I mean, it's like, do I like Jim? And it was a huge battle because a lot of the time the studios, uh, I mean, I don't write screenplays. I'm not linear. I don't think like an American filmmaker and I write stuff that is very contrary, and sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. But they said, uh, what is, uh, you know, is very much Sid Fieldish uh, manual, you know, what is Jim's problem? I say, he doesn't have a problem. He's a good kid. I really wanted a show with two good kids that, uh, that you wanted to be with. And I said, his problem comes from the complications in the story. Second and third season take Jim to a really difficult place, very difficult. But that, you never know. So it was not a feature. We tried to make it a feature. It was not, then they said TV. But I started, I pitched it to Fox, uh, 2006. I pitched The Strain, Troll Hunters, and another one that was called uh, uh, Flashback. And they said no to all three of them. So I said, well, let's write The Strain as a novel. Let's write Troll Hunters as a novel. And then we'll pitch it again somewhere else. So one ends up at Fox, the string goes full circle, and Troll Hunters was pitched as a TV series, live action, very different, harder edge. I was trying to do young readers, you know, teenagers, and so it comes full circle. So you never know, you go, it took almost 10 years, but it may fail. <laughs> Jim Cameron said once to me, we, we met in, in 1993 the first time, and we were in a barbecue line, and he says, I hear you did your first movie called Cross. I go, yeah. I hear you mortgage your house. I say, yeah. He says, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to be a success. Because <laughs> you hear all the stories. So you never know. Well, worth the, as long as it's worth the wait, perfectly fine. And this yeah. definitely was. Thank you. So you teased seasons two and three a little. And I assume that's going to mean we're spending more time in the dark land. So I was just curious, what were some of your visual inspirations for that area? Well, we haven't been authorized for, for three. But the thing is, we mapped it. You know, mm -hmm. we said, let's map from the beginning. We said, look. The first season, quote unquote, is two seasons, is 26 episodes. So we mapped out uh, 52 episodes. I said, let's know where we're going from the beginning. Because binge watching, uh, what is great is when you feel the series has a structure. That is not, you're not reacting to the weekly. You know, like uh, uh, the strain is a very different exercise. It's TV, so people don't like a character. The writer's room kills the character, <laughs> redeems the characters, whatever. But here is, um, we mapped it, and uh, it, it, the series goes, my idea was, if we're doing those seasons, if we succeed and do those seasons, let the series go older with the viewers. Hmm. Let, let's go to more difficult places, let's go to more uh, complex concerns, little by little. So, yes, the Darklands is a part of second season, yeah. And is there any new characters that you can tease? Oh, yes. Yeah. I cannot tease, but there's some great oh. characters and great voice actors. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, and some of them, I mean, I suppose we'll unveil some of them at Comic-Con, at one of the Comic-Cons, but uh, we have particularly two. 
I think that if you're a geek, you're gonna geek out. There's yeah. so many characters that I love in this and just so many little elements of this whole troll hunter world that you've mm -hmm. built. And you kind of establish, I'm, I'm a big stickler for the rules. I like logical things where I could say, oh, because of this, this can't mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. You present the rules of the troll hunter realm in a way where you kind of, you respect the rules, but you also leave it open for just about anything to be a possibility. Especially rule number three. <laughs> <laughs> you got to respect that. Where do you draw the line, though? Is there any point in coming up with this whole thing where you're like, all right, that's a little too much? Well, writer's rooms, what you do is you argue about these things. You know, you're, you're together with 12 people that, uh, like you, never got sunshine so, and ate Cheetos all day. So you're arguing all day about these things, like you would argue as a fan. But I think, uh, I think that all you're doing, look, it, everything we tell is a lie, uh, but it's emotionally true. You know, so what you do, what you do when you do a lie, if you say, if you arrive 20 minutes late and you say, I, there was a lot of traffic, I go, bullshit. But if you tell me there was a lot of traffic and then I was almost parking and this guy in a Corvette parked the asshole and I couldn't, and I honked and he came, the details, the alibi makes it sound like you really went through that. So that's what you argue. You argue about alibis. You say, you know, every time I need something, I say, well, let's use the bullshitanium material, you know? Like we say, it's made of bullshitanium, you know? And we then come up with the... With the I with need the to start term. using that term. Yeah, we say bullshitanium blue, you know? <laughs> it's bullshitanium blue, you know? I like that. So, but you, you try, like for example, when we did Pac Rim, John Knoll at ILM, who is a, like a certified genius. This is, you know, everybody knows he's one of the creators of Photoshop. He's right there with Dennis Muir and as an intellect. And uh, he's, he started saying, well, uh, the, if the robots has, uh, have X mass and they go between buildings, they're displacing air and they are moving. Like, and we, we started making simulations, you know, and then, we, then I started adding foreground because otherwise the parallax on something that big is, you, you cannot focally uh, change it because then it starts looking like miniatures. And we start doing those rules that all they are are visual or uh, thematic alibis. Mm -hmm to allow you to commit the crime of telling a lie. No? I gotta keep reminding myself of all this. Yeah. Speaking of Pacific Rim, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about just coming to the decision that it's time for me to step away as a director and hand the reins over to someone else, because yeah. that, that was your, your baby. I yeah, imagine that, that was tough. That, that, was, that was actually not, not so tough because the timing uh, started to suck. <laughs> you know, I had this little movie that I wanted to do, The Shape of Water, very, very much. At one point it was Justice League Dark or Pacific Rim. I said, Let, let's go to Pacific Rim. Then, you know, the, the, the reality is uh, they said we're going to need to postpone because they were uh, changing hands. Legendary was going to be sold to China, to a Chinese company. And they said, we got to wait nine months. And I said, I'm not waiting nine months. I'm shooting a movie. And I went and shot the other movie. And we chose Steven the Night, you know, and, uh, you know, it's... It was such a great choice. I mean, I love the guy, love what he does. I think he's really brilliant. And, you know, he's making it his own. I mean, I'm not breathing over his shoulder, saying, what are you doing, what are you doing? He's doing things differently. And I like that. You know, when I produce, I try to be produced the way I would like to be produced. Like, if I, if I would like a producer that is there all the time, I say to everyone I produce, I say, you need me, I'll be there 100% all the time. You don't need me. I'm not there. You know, you show me the cut, then oh, then we start interacting. How did it go on this production? What was most helpful it's for him? It's still on, still going on. Did Does he have you come to set a lot to help him out? No, he said, you know, uh, right now they're still going and it's going great. I see dailies, you know, I see dailies uh, every day. I see early cuts, I see teasers. They're doing great. I mean, I think uh, is uh, is uh, is to let him have his style, let him have his notion of the characters. You know, uh, I wrote a screenplay, developed uh, two or three drafts of that screenplay. This is different than what I developed, and I'm okay. Uh, a producer is in the corner, the director is in the ring. You're not getting beat. The producer is not getting the punches, the director is. So shut up, wait in the corner, refresh the towel, and wait for the director to come to you. I wish that was always how it was. Well, it, it, needs, it needs to be because, uh, see, uh, movies, are a very, movies are like football or sports. You see them and you go, he should have done that, he should have, you know, but uh, a career is like a car accident in super slow motion for the one inside. 
You know, you're outside, you see it in real time. That's it. Oh, that happened to him. To the guy inside of, of, the, of the car, you go, oh, fuck. You hit the wheel, you bounce back, you hit the seat, and it's your life. It's your Monday, your Tuesday, your Wednesday. And what you find out when you're a producer, when you interact with a lot of people in the industry, is that once the, the loneliest place in the world is right behind the camera and right in front of it, the actor and the director. And 90% of the people that get involved in the process uh, of green lighting, blah, blah, they really don't have an idea on how a movie is actually made mm -hmm. day to day. So it's the director I have enormous respect. I, I have only had, I, I think I produce about 20 movies. And I think uh, I had had a hard time only once. Hmm. And that was very difficult for me and the director. The rest of the time, your job is to choose well and, and watch. Are there any long-term plans for the Pacific Rim franchise, especially for you as a director? If you wanted to return, do you think that would work out? Well, legendary, uh, legendary uh, changed hands. So, you know, these are micro movements. We are citizens. You know, we live in the neighborhood. We're not the president. You know, we, we, can, we, we affect policy, we don't make policy. Me, I would love to do an animated series, I would love to do this, I, I have all the toys. An animated series for Netflix, that yeah, actually yeah, sounds like the most appropriate be, place it, for it. It would be a great place, but uh, you know, I, I do not run the company, I would hope so. You know, uh, we found, we, we were one of the 10 most profitable um, original content that year. We were uh, we outperformed like crazy in all of Asia, not only in China. That's why they they went at it. I mean, they went at it because the numbers made sense, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'm not involved in the we gotta do this. I am involved when I control my things I create from scratch. But if a studio has Justice League Dark or Pacific Rim or mm -hmm. the Hellboys, you know, ultimately the guys that own the rights have to decide. Mm -hmm. Now I have to ask you about a project that I haven't heard any updates on in a little while, but obviously it is so you as a director mm -hmm. with your style and your type of content. Yeah, let me guess, Hunter Mansion? I was gonna say uh, Mountain's Madness. Oh, yeah. Cause wow, yeah, do yeah. I wanna see that happen. Well, what we'll do is one day, one day um, I'll show you the art. I'll show you everything we did. I mean, we did over 300 pieces of art. We did storyboards, we did models. Uh, we had a whole presentation and you will cry. Oh, you, you will about why? It's gonna break my heart. But a lot of people think of directors like uh, like these Caesars and sitting on a chess lounge with somebody feeding them grapes, and and you say, I would like to do Mountains of Madness now, and and, and it's not. It's you you're you're a you're a blue collar guy, <laughs> working your way out of you know putting numbers uh, in front of studios, putting stars packages whatever. And you have your, your stuff to, to move. And then that's why I try to do a small movie and a big movie. Because the small movies, you suffer with the budget, but you have complete freedom. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want. And that gives you a life. So is there any particular thing that'd be holding that back? Is it, is it budget? Because it is well, a big scale production. I mean, uh, we thought we had a very good uh, safe package. We said 150, Tom Cruise, Jim Cameron producing, ILM doing the effects, here's the art. This is the concept, because I really think uh, big scale horror would be great, but there was a difference of, of opinion. The studio didn't think so. Well, but they, maybe big uh, the scale. R. Uh, the R was what made it. Well, big scale R-rated superhero stuff. I mean, we have yeah. Deadpool and Logan that are crushing it right now. Maybe no, that'll no, kind of pave the way. You know, the the thing uh, that if if Mountains had been PG-13, or I had said PG-13, um. I'm too much of a Boy Scout, you know. I should have lied like most of my colleagues do, <laughs> but uh, but I didn't. And uh, you know, the, but the R-rated, uh, we all think from outside. We think, oh, the studio's gonna learn this or that. But studios don't think that way. I mean, I, I remember um, a joke somebody said to me about a, a drunken guy that goes to a revival tent, and they pour uh, alcohol and they put a worm, and you see the flesh of the worm dissolve on the alcohol. And they say, what did you learn? And the drunken guy says that if I drink, I won't have worms. That's sort of the way the studio mentality works. Oh. They don't, you know, everything is an exception. You need to come in with a, with a way or numbers that make sense. There was a Hellboy 2, because uh, Hellboy 1, 
theatrically did what it did, but after did double that on DVD, Blu-ray, blah, blah, mm -hmm. Hellboy 2, sort of the same phenomenon, but those ancillary markets are now dead for Hellboy 3. There's no Blu-ray, there's no DVD, uh, digital is different, so you know, these things change. You gotta learn a little of that to survive and be able to pitch your wares. Huh? Is there any kind of trend that's happening now in the movie industry that gives you hope for things like this happening? Because you're talking about certain markets going away. And we also have that thing now where they're talking about decreasing the window between uh, theatrical release and DVD release, like just the rise of Netflix and VOD. Is there any kind of technology or big shift that you think could maybe help get these more unique projects off the ground? I think if you look to the past, you, you are doing a mistake. I mean, you need to look to what, what is going to happen. And I think what is happening, uh, uh, I am old enough, you, you're not, but I'm old enough that I grew up seeing uh, every medium appear by itself. I was born, TV was black and white, then color TV, then video games. I had the first telepong in my block. <laughs> then, I, you know, uh, then I went to uh, this and that cinema, we went from scope to this and that. Everything has mutated, but for a, a young person, a kid, age 10, all this medium and the language and the language of RV or this and that, it's completely natural. There's a seamless learning of this media. So the next media, I think film as we know it exactly, is fading, but storytelling is not. It will never. We as animals, we are the only mammals that tell complex stories to each other to learn the, who we are. So that won't change, but the mediums are changing, and I think it, it will never be the same. So you're gonna look and say, how do we bring the past back? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think you look to the future and say, does it look exciting? For me, it does. Yeah, I mean, you're kind of exemplifying all that now with just exploring different titles on, on a medium like Netflix. And, mm -hmm. you know, even the idea of taking old famous properties and turning them into something new. I know your Pinocchio take is something I really want to see. I'm also addicted to stop motion. I am just yes. endlessly fascinated by that. Yeah, me too. I think it has a very special quality and you cannot, you know, when I see great CG movies that try to look like stop motion, uh, I go, let's do it stop motion, do it. Uh, sometimes I, even even smooth movies that smooth the stop motion digitally, I, I, I like to see the fur move, I like to see the clay fingerprints, I like, I think there's a beautiful magic to that. I, I love Fantastic Mr. Fox because yeah. they go raw, they go with the fur moving like the Harryhausen fairy tales, you know, and this and that. But uh, I think with the new media, what you seriously do is you adapt to it. When we did Troll Hunters, I said, I want to structure it for binge watching. I really do, I really want. So we started, we would do board and animatics for three, four, five shows. And then we would screen them on it all at once. We would order lunch and we would binge watch. And say, no, no, this transition is a little weak. So you structure it like as if the 26 episodes are a three act structure. And that's why the finale of the second season is so brutal. I was gonna say, it's kind of evil what you do with that series, because yeah. that, that, that family started to feel like a family to me, and yeah. when they're yeah. gone, it's, you know, I'm sitting on the couch, I'm like, oh, well, what do I do now? <laughs> fat, I go online and I- bastard. I go yeah. online and I try to find all the Funko Pop toys, that's what I do, yeah, and I spend I all my too. money. Yeah. <laughs> so I also wanted to ask you about uh, Shape of Water as well, because you talked about it before. We had Doug in the studio, and he had said this. He said he speaks too much. He he's incredible. He's he something talks, else. He, he talks too much, and he's well, too nice. I think he's a serial killer, really. Because <laughs> he's, he's, he's too so nice. He's the nicest no one. one's not, no one's that nice. No one. I, if something's wrong with Doug. I don't care if there's something wrong with him. He's the greatest guy. He's the most adorable. And he's, he's yeah. so talented. But yeah. he did say, if this doesn't end up with Guillermo back at the Oscars, I will be surprised. You know, I, I, I would disagree with him because uh, genre is genre. Mm -hmm. And I know it, and I knew it. And my goal, uh, honestly, is to tell the stories I want to tell. And genre is, a, a, genre is a, a bastard child of prestige, you know? You're never, you never, if ever, if it, the, the fact that it already happened is great, but I, I don't calculate or think mm -hmm. like that because we're always a movie about something in the fantastic genre. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I think it's a gorgeous movie. I 
watch it, in, and every time I watch it, I, I'm moved to tears. So that's what I know. Oh, I and and I really am moved to tears. I, uh, my editor and I, we, we finish watching the movie and we look away. You know, it is, if it moves me is what I do. I never think of trends. I never think, no one wanted a gothic romance. No one wanted a gothic romance when I did Crimson Peak, as I will find out, you know. No one wanted giant robots uh, versus monsters. I wanted it. You know, now there are more giant robots are appearing. That's great. But, but you, you don't think, you think like that when you get to the end of your life and you, you did something that was not your will. Then you'd live somebody else's life for what? Two years, three years that it takes to make a movie? Mm -hmm. Five years sometimes? It's boring. Now you speak about all your work and just you're, you're making what you want to make and you're making stuff that's, that's very different and stuff that we haven't seen before. Then again, on the other end of the industry, we also have this incessant trend where we're constantly remaking and redoing mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're, you could, I don't know what the status of it, but with Pinocchio, you could potentially do it. So yeah. is, it a, is it a goal for you to kind of make it something different, especially when Disney is having so much success at this point, just doing yeah, the same? Well, well, my Pinocchio wouldn't be healthy for Disney. My well, Pinocchio wouldn't be... I would hope that your Pinocchio oh, wouldn't be healthy for Disney. No, no, no. But it's like I'm doing Fantastic Voyage with Jim mm -hmm. Cameron producing. And if I didn't think it has something completely different to offer, when it comes from a book, it's a version. I think remake is when you really only base it on the screenplay. And the screenplay is the same. You're just doing some form of almost colorization, you know? I think that uh, when you take the same source, I mean, if, if every time somebody does Shakespeare in the theater, it was a remake, the theater would be a, a business of pure remakes. Mm -hmm. But you go, you go at it and say, first of all, you go at it from your gut. I want to, I, and more importantly, I need to do this movie. What you need to be careful with is if you get used to the big budgets and the pampering, if that's what you go for, uh, then you, you, you can get paralyzed or you can, like Pinocchio, end up with bad company, you know, with the fox and the fox and the cat. But, but what I think is what you do is you stay as clean as you can, you, you sleep very well at night, and you do uh, only what you need to do. Like uh, I, I, my, when my screenplay teacher said, make the movies that, that need you, not the movies that you need. Mm -hmm. And I was 20, whatever, and I take that lesson still to this day. And when they don't give me money for a big one, I do a small one. Yeah. What have you hell? ever been approached to have anybody remake one of your earlier movies? No, but I punch them. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, if I don't control them, of course they can. Yeah. If somebody wants to do Blade again, mm -hmm. of course they can. If somebody wants to do Hellboy or they want to do a Pacific Rim or something I don't control, of course they can. But if they try and approach me for Kronos or Devil's Bag, well, well you should continue uh, Kronos. Yeah. Find, find maybe I like should, another device somewhere that, else. That I would like to remake, you know, because I. A first movie is a first movie. It's like well, it still stands on its own, still to this day. Though I don't know where it's standing, but it still stands for sure. <laughs> I like it. I, I like some of it. I love. I love the spirit. I love moments. I think in many ways is the the most oblique of the movies. Like it comes to a myth in a different way and all that. But you, I see all the mistakes. <laughs> And now one question I have to ask, because at Collider we have so many Star Wars fans, and as a big Star Wars fan myself, one of the coolest things that they're doing right now are these standalone movies, yeah. where they're exploring different ends of the universe, hopefully different tones, they're bringing on directors with some real style to them, yeah, yeah, and sure. they're letting them do their thing. Yeah. If they ever approached you for a Star Wars movie, would you want to do it? And is there anything in particular you would want to bring to screen? In 2006, uh, Mike Fleming at Deadline wrote an article that said Guillermo del Toro is busy until 2012 and he published 20 things I was maybe doing and since then I haven't been able to live down that <laughs> and every time I say good morning uh, somebody says Guillermo is doing good morning <laughs> so I will not comment on if this. If that was a headline no, I would still watch be, it. <laughs> because, because then somebody will say oh Guillermo is doing <laughs> And I, and, and I look like a cook, like somebody, Neil Gaiman once said, well, I would love to write Doctor Strange with Guillermo. And all of a sudden, in, in IMDb, is, I had Doctor oh, Strange. God. But, you know, uh, saying all that caveat, I would say it's a great, there's some characters that are great. And I have talked to uh, Kathy Kennedy and, mm -hmm. and John Knoll about ideas, but, you know, I want to do my shit. I want to <laughs> do my shit, I want to do it first, and I... I'm, I'm veering a lot towards animation. Mm -hmm. I love animation. 
the pace is better. I mean, you, you have three years to fuck up, so you fuck up a lot <laughs> less. You know, you, you don't have a life. Making movies is, is really like a roller coaster, and until you make one, you don't understand the amount of pressure. And it all goes to one focal point, and it's the director and the actor in front of the director. And you have 30 seconds to make something really great. On animation, what is great is you, you, you paste it, you edit it in paper, and you are able to direct the gestures very minutely, like directing the gestures on, on the robots on Pac Rim, which has 40 minutes of animation. I decided to go for this dark style that was gothic, I used to call it, and which is gothic but with, with technology. And, and we would, the most minute gesture of the finger, I could direct. I would say, I want him to spasm this way, I want water to be this large that way, and I would draw on the screen, and it's fantastic because you have two years, three years to, to make sure the actor is, Hitchcock used to say, I envy Walt Disney because if he doesn't like an actor, he crushes <laughs> the paper. <laughs> you know? So we've got more Troll Hunters, we've got uh, Shape, Shape of Water, Water coming our way, and uh, production-wise, what's what's next? I think I think it's going to be a fantastic voyage. Nice. I think I think is uh, I mean we're very far ahead with a lot of stuff. We're budgeting and all that, but you never know. And I want to complete the trilogy of Spanish movies uh, of the Civil War and uh, Pinocchio. I would I mean yeah. we're trying to finish a deal with Amazon, and uh, you know I think. Uh, it's a story, Pinocchio is Frankenstein, at the end of the day. It's a, it's a story of a, 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 an innocent soul uh, thrown into the world by an uncaring father and the adventures that he, he has in the real world and comes back with an understanding, you know, to his father. So it's, it's very much close to me. Yeah, well, if you also announced Good Morning by Guillermo del Toro, yes. Yes. I'd be the first one to buy a yeah, ticket. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank My you pleasure. so much for coming in. This was such a treat. Congratulations Thanks. on everything. I'm looking forward to everything else you do. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's try to get to WonderCon. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got a whole bunch of Troll Hunter fans that would love to see you. I mean, uh, you. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you soon. Adios. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.